Hi, I'm Taras Giria. Hi, I'm Bob Stern. And we're here to tell you about two of the most important transformations in Earth history and how those are related. These are the evolution of complex life on Earth and a tectonic transformation. Both of these episodes happened in Neoproterozoic time, 1,000 to 541 million years ago. Let's explore each of these separately and then talk about how the tectonic transformation caused the biological revolution. Let's talk about life first. Life began very early in Earth history, no later than 3.8 billion years ago. A key step was the evolution of photosynthetic cyanobacteria. These organisms produced oxygen, transforming Earth's atmosphere and oceans from reducing to oxidizing, and setting the stage for the evolution of much more complex life. This was slow in coming, taking more than a billion years for animals with specialized cell functions, metazoans, to evolve. It wasn't until Neoproterozoic time was half over that the 13 animal lineages came into being. And since that time, increasingly complex life has evolved rapidly. We have a good understanding of the important steps in biological evolution and when these occurred, at least for the last half of Earth history. What caused biological evolution to accelerate in late Neoproterozoic time is much more controversial. Now let's talk about Earth's tectonic evolution. All serious geoscientists agree that plate tectonics dominates Earth's mantle convection and lithospheric deformation today. But when plate tectonics began, and what was Earth's tectonic style before this, is very controversial. June Coronaga made this summary of what a representative group of geoscientists thought about when plate tectonics began. You can see there is a lot of disagreement with estimates ranging from less than a billion years ago to more than four billion years ago. The state of this controversy was re-examined by Richard Palin and co-authors last year, and the controversy shows no signs of abating. In spite of this disagreement, we need to resolve this controversy if we are to build a robust Earth history and understand what caused biological evolution to accelerate in Neoproterozoic time. A key constraint for resolving the controversy about when plate tectonics began is to have some idea of what a non-plate tectonic regime might be and how to recognize evidence for this in the rock record. This is now possible because we have sent spacecraft to study all the planets, moons, and asteroids of our solar system with diameters greater than a few hundred kilometers. A few of these are silicate bodies, which can be usefully compared to the Earth. Size is the most important control on whether a silicate body is actively convecting or dead. Anything the size of Mercury or smaller has been dead for a long time except for Jupiter's innermost moon, Io. Io's interior is heated by being squeezed and stretched due to Jupiter's gravity. With this exception, whether a silicate body is active or dead depends on how much the body has cooled, which reflects its size. Larger bodies, like Earth and Venus, cool more slowly than smaller bodies, and retain enough interior heat to remain active. Even the interiors of these large bodies have cooled significantly since they formed, and their tectonic styles are likely to have changed over the four and a half billions they have existed. All three of the active silicate bodies other than Earth show different kinds of single lid tectonics. Io is the most active and shows a heat pipe style. Venus is very active with many mantle plumes and lithospheric drips, and Mars shows evidence of a few good plumes and drips. Among the active silicate bodies in the solar system, only Earth has plate tectonics. 
These observations compelled the conclusion that before plate tectonics began, Earth had some type of active single lid tectonics. Here is a simplified model for the evolution of Earth and other active and cooling silicate bodies. A magma ocean existed at first when the body was very hot. As it cooled, the magma ocean developed a weak crust and a heat pipe single lid style like that of Io. With more time and cooling, mantle lithosphere began to form. But this was weak, and a single lid style with many small scale drips evolved. This lithosphere was too weak and buoyant to subduct, so plate tectonics was impossible. Venus might be a good example of this single lid tectonic style. As the body continued to cool, the mantle lithosphere thickened, strengthened, and became denser. At some stage, the mantle lithosphere became dense enough to subduct and strong enough to pull the lithosphere. At this later stage, plate tectonics could begin, if the strong lithosphere can be ruptured to start the first subduction zone. Alternatively, if the plate is not ruptured, the cooling body may evolve into a single lid tectonic style with a few major delaminations and mantle plumes, like Mars today. Finally, once it cools enough, the body evolves into terminal single lid where convection and magmatism end. It becomes a dead body, like the Moon or Mercury. What does all this have to do with the controversy about when plate tectonics began? This discussion drives home the point that active silicate bodies, like the Earth, will go through some major changes in their convection and tectonic style as they cool. This simple analysis also tells us that some kind of single lid tectonic regime is normal and that plate tectonics is unusual, but it doesn't tell us much about when the transition between single lid and plate tectonics occurred on Earth. For that, we need to examine the rock record for evidence about when single lid tectonics, plate tectonics, and the transition from single lid to plate tectonics occurred we can identify three groups of plate tectonic indicators. Seafloor spreading and subduction initiation indicators, subduction indicators, and collision indicators. With a few exceptions, about 1.8 to 2 billion years ago, these all appear in Neoproterozoic time. That does not by itself demonstrate that plate tectonics began in Neoproterozoic time. We must also demonstrate that a single lid tectonic style existed before this in Mesoproterozoic time. The Mesoproterozoic lasted for 600 million years and is the heart of what geoscientists call the boring billion because so little happened during this time. To demonstrate a Mesoproterozoic single lid episode, we need to look at possible indicators of this tectonic style. Four geologic indicators can be suggested. Two kinds of unusually dry magmas, A-type granites and anorthosites. Thermobarometric evidence of thermal insulation from metamorphic assemblages. And the lack of new passive continental margins. All of these are consistent with a single lid tectonic regime in Mesoproterozoic time. Let's look at these one by one. Single lid tectonics cannot supply the amount of water to the mantle that plate tectonics can, so magmas generated by a single lid tectonic regime should be unusually dry, and they are. A single lithospheric lid will insulate the mantle, causing it to heat up as is seen. Finally, single lid tectonics cannot generate new passive margins, and almost none were created in the Mesoproterozoic. Maybe you are still unconvinced that the Mesoproterozoic tectonic regime was fundamentally different than that of the modern Earth. Let's look at some other indicators. Ore deposits tell a similar story to the plate tectonic indicators we've just discussed. The kinds of ore deposits that are common in Neoproterozoic and Younger Time, like orogenic gold and porphyry copper deposits, are missing from the Mesoproterozoic. One more test is useful. The transition from a single lid tectonic regime to plate tectonics whenever it happened, is likely to destabilize all surface Earth systems, especially climate. 
Such a disruption is documented by the Neoproterozoic Snowball Earth episode, which occurred over about 150 million years of cryogenian and Ediacaran time, and in the wild fluctuations of carbon isotopic compositions that encompass nearly all of Neoproterozoic time. Many explanations have been offered for what caused Neoproterozoic Snowball Earth, and there are likely to have been multiple causes. Most of these causes are related to the protracted transition from single lid to plate tectonics. We are only beginning to explore the implications of Earth's tectonic reorganization in the Neoproterozoic Earth life system. Taurus and his group and others at Eteha Zurich are applying numerical modeling approaches to model Earth life interactions. Discussing the results of these studies are beyond the scope of this talk, but a few general comments can be made. The transition from one tectonic style to another is likely to affect life and evolution in three main ways. First, the supply of bioactive elements like phosphorus and iron is likely to be different. Bioactive elements like phosphorus and iron are very important for life, and an inadequate supply limits the amount of life that can be supported. Second, different tectonic regimes modulate climate differently. For example, weathering draws down atmospheric carbon dioxide, cooling the planet. Changing sea level can flood the continents in warm climate or expose more continent, causing a harsher climate. Any tectonic style that encourages weathering and changes sea level will modify climate. Finally, different tectonic regimes create and destroy habitats differently. For example, plate tectonics continuously fragments oceanic and continental realms, creating and destroying habitats much more effectively than does single lid. Plate tectonics is a stronger agent for increasing the supply of bioactive elements, modulating the climate, and creating and destroying habitats than is single lid tectonics. For these reasons, it is not surprising that biological evolution accelerated in late Neoproterozoic time at the same time that a new tectonic regime was being established. Thanks for listening and stay tuned to new developments. Please visit the ETEHA Biogeodynamics website and learn more about who we are and what we're doing.